All right. Well, I think we will get underway. Uh, our speaker tonight is very distinguished. He comes to us originally, or your first public garden was Hawaii, correct? And then, as most of the people in this room would know, he was here um, at Striving when it was Striving, uh, and was also in charge of the Conservatory uh, of Flowers in Golden Gate Park at the same time. And I think the last thing that got added to your plate back then was the city street trees of San Francisco. Uh, so uh, clearly Scott and juggle a lot of different projects and tasks at the same time. Right after he got all those assignments, he was poached by Brooklyn Botanic Garden, whom most people in this audience would also know uh, in New York, uh, to be the president of that uh, organization for, gosh, how long was it? Nearly 15 years. 15 years. And then he recently, right at the very beginning of the pandemic, I think the day when we all went into quarantine, he arrived at what was then Quarry Hill Botanic Garden and is now Sonoma Botanic Garden uh, to be the executive director there. Um, many people, how many people have been to Quarry Hill or Sonoma Botanic Garden? Yeah, okay, most people. Um, and he has major plans for that garden, which I'm sure we'll hear about this evening. But um, Scott has, or is also on the uh, board of directors for the Center for Plant Conservation, uh, many, many organizations. Um, I probably don't even know the full breadth, but I know there are innumerable so without further ado, Scott Medbury. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure, Bart, and thank you very much. And how nice to see such a great audience here. And I think we've got people on Zoom as well. So it's a thrill for me to be in this room, I will tell you, because as director back in the day, I think I've not been here in some, I think 17 years, I figured. But, and I last spoke to Cal Hort 25 years ago when we were contemplating the renovation of the New Zealand garden here. So uh, it's, it's special to be here in particular because I put a little effort into this building. So it's nice to see it functioning in the wonderful way it was intended when it was built to serve plant societies and to serve horticultural education. Um, uh, when in my tenure, we had like delaminating asbestos everywhere and a, a lot of uh, challenges and we did some acoustical upgrades in this room and a lot of other things. So it, it's holding up nicely. So it's really fun to be here for me. Um, well, now I've got a big surprise for you all because I am very eager for the California Horticultural Society to pay yet another visit if you've been before to Sonoma Botanical Garden and to see what we've been up to during the pandemic and to hear on the ground some of our plans for that very special place, that beautiful 67 acre property. And, you know, I've had, I was a trustee of Quarry Hill when I served as director here in Golden Gate Park. Uh, uh, me and one of the botanists at the California Academy of Sciences were the first uh, to join that board after our founder, Jane Davenport Jensen, passed away in 2000. And they felt like they needed some people that knew a little bit about public gardens and management. And so I've, I've been associated with that garden for a long time and actually was first brought there by a really stalwart member of Cal Hort, uh, May Arbogast, who first introduced me to uh, Quarry Hill about uh, the fall of 1992. I always think now, you know, that I find myself there as director, you know, that, that maybe there's a little method to her madness because she was very interested in me taking an interest in that. And it's an interesting place. So I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, some of the opportunities, but certainly some of the challenges of which there's more than a few in, in a changing climate and, and um, with some vulnerabilities up there. Now, here's the big surprise. I am not going to regale you with pretty pictures of plants this evening. I'm going to do this a little different, a little Vegas style. So you all have, you've eaten your pizza. You all have to stay awake because I'm going to be watching you and come out here. But um, we've had a little bit of a technical difficulty with a presentation. And that's, 
maybe a first in my career, but I think we can roll with it because I, I, I really have that presentation committed to memory. And what we're going to do is we're going to put it up on the website like the next couple days. So if you would be willing to kind of roll with me, uh, and I hope there will be some good questions because I have some great content to share with you. Um, and then look at the, the slideshow because it will sort of track what I'm going to do here first. So what I was going to do was kind of three parts is I want to tell you a little bit about what I've been up to since I left this beautiful place. And I was saying to Dick, I feel like I left a little piece of me in this garden. I, I wasn't here that long, about seven years as director, but I really, I really threw myself at it and really yeah, believe in the beauty of this place and its potential. And it's amazing to see it looking so good. The collections are extraordinary and the, the potential remains as strong. I can tell you a little bit about how it was that I, I came to go to New York. It was really quite interesting. I never could have imagined. I largely grew up in Hawaii and in the Pacific Northwest. And then, you know, to go from the, you know, being a completely West Coast person to go to New York City was just not in my um, wildest imagination. So that was an extraordinary experience. And I'll so I want to tell you a little bit about what happened in Brooklyn while I was there. And then uh, also uh, give a little uh, sense of what kind of catapulted me back west and what, what I've been thinking about out here. Uh, 10 years ago, my partner, Brian Lim, who's here with us, who was a, a former librarian here at Striving Arboretum and a former librarian at the California Academy of Sciences, where he was when the Loma Prieta earthquake condemned that building. So Brian can tell you stories about that. Um, he and I bought a property in Brookings, Oregon, just over the California border on the coast. And I would argue that is the finest horticultural climate in North America and would go on any panel and defend that. My good friend, Sean Hogan at Cistus Nursery is maybe even more knowledgeable about the climate of Brookings, but what it is basically, for those of you who know the Sunset Magazine zonation, it is in Sunset Zone, zone 17. It's almost the last of it. It just barely dribbles into Oregon. But unlike the rest of Sunset Zone 17, like where we are right here and in the Sunset here district, uh, it's not in the fog. You sit there and you look at Crescent City and you think, oh, that's like out there on Terraval and you know Ocean Beach or something. It's just shivering in the fog all summer long. Brookings is really sunny. So you're immediately proximate yeah, to the coast, it's but it's sunny. So things grow either. like mad that otherwise sort of struggle in the fog climate. And that includes a lot of Southern Hemisphere things that have just flowered and grown amazingly. Wow. So I want to tell you a little bit about what I'm doing there. And then, of course, what our uh, emerging vision is for Sonoma Botanical Garden, how we not only changed our name during the pandemic and how that came about, but also uh, expanded or enhanced our mission to embrace the cultivation and interpretation of the flora of California, in addition to our historic focus on the flora of Asia. And you know, the story of Quarry Hill is quite an extraordinary one, our founder and what happened there. But with that comes some real challenges today. And so I'm gonna be frank with all of you horticulturists, what, what are those challenges and what might be some of the fixes for that? So there's the presentation a little bit. So, um, you know, I, it's interesting. I served as uh, six months into the job of becoming, I think, either no, the fifth or the sixth um, director of the Striving Arboretum. My uh, talented predecessor, Walt Valen, retired, and I was honored to be chosen. Uh, six months into that job, the longtime uh, supervisor at the Conservatory of Flowers, just as they were merging to mount a campaign and restore that historic building, he, uh, he decided to retire. And so the general manager of the Recreation Park Department called me up over here and she said, are you sitting down? I go, yes, why? And next thing you know, I was serving as director of the conservatory simultaneously to the garden. And so I had this kind of split job for a while and it was all good. I kept thinking that these two institutions should be run in tandem. And it's really exciting to see today that that vision has come to, uh, is coming together and, and going forward. I said, the sum is greater than the parts, you know, uh, the extraordinary San Francisco Botanical Garden has two extraordinary facilities in Golden Gate Park, the 1878 Historic Conservatory of Flowers and the beautiful 55 acre striving arboretum. So that's a really good thing. You know, both of these institutions have sort of struggled in the city to really be at the table with the big kids and for the botanical garden to be what it is in other great American cities where it's really, you know, an alpha cultural institution. And it's not as though this garden isn't that in terms of its rich living collections, it's extraordinary, but it really hasn't commanded the attention and the bandwidth and the, and the resources that uh, you just look at cities like Denver or 
Phoenix or others that have taken those gardens to really great heights and doing extraordinary pro programs and really caring for their collections in a way that, you know, we I, I wouldn't say, you know, a little starved here, but it's never all that it could be. So anyway, I was doing both of those jobs and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, we got a new general manager. We got a new mayor, Gavin Newsom, who, who is now our governor. And, um, you know, I was given a broader assignment. I was assigned six other administrative units in the park department, in addition to the Botanical Garden and the Conservatory. And at that moment, you know, the garden basically lost its director and they were all important roles. And I, ha I did that for about six months. And, and they were all interesting and sort of plant related, the natural areas program, the, the, the park nursery here, the uh, urban forestry division. And um, so that, that was interesting, but that was, it was kind of too much. I thought, wow, you know, they're so easily, you know, the easy way to mess up. I think the biggest and difficult ones, I served as liaison to the city attorney's office for hazard tree uh, litigation. Like if a big Monterey Cypress comes down and crushes somebody in a car, that is a call you have to return in five minutes. And so I did that for a while, but interestingly, the day that I, you know, I've been dodging that assignment, I got it was the day that Brooklyn Botanic Garden called. And I returned the call thinking it was a colleague in New York. And instead it was a search firm, which I normally just was like, you know, how did you get this number? You know, because I was really strapped to the mast and really committed to making this institution be what it could be in this great country. And so nevertheless, there it was. Um, I ended up going to New York City and serving as the sixth leader of uh, Brooklyn Botanic Garden, founded in 1910, one of the great American gardens in youth environmental education, especially, you know, creating the first children's garden and a botanic garden in the world in 1914, uh, having the first, you know, one of the first, you know, there's a few others in this kind of sphere that created sort of eco-geographic representations of what the flora had been like in that city prior to human settlement or European colonization. And that is the 1911 uh, native flora garden at Brooklyn, which uh, the prospectus for that garden in 1910 used the word ecology, which had only been coined three years earlier. So it was really out of the box visionary that plants grow in communities and that you could grow them together and they would have relationships and things. So it's a great honor to go there. The Brooklyn experience was amazing. My predecessors were all extraordinary. I, you know, on the back of giants and especially in the environmental education uh, arena, we had, uh, we served about 250,000 school children a year through programs out in the schools and through visits to the garden. We especially targeted the least advantaged New Yorkers in the toughest neighborhoods. And all what you could say about Brooklyn being this hipster place of artisanal cheese, you could also say some of the most deeply entrenched challenges in socioeconomic challenges exist there as well. So we were in the Title I schools in really amazing ways. And working with especially young kids with um, you know, summer programs, the junior botanists, the plant investigators, programs that took kids camping that it, kids had learned out of the school. We also had a middle to high school leadership development program that served all five boroughs. We had superhero kids that took the subway from Staten Island to Brooklyn Botanic Garden to be with us for the day. And uh, they would do a little science symposium in the summer, it was amazing. And then uh, more perhaps amazingly, we had our own environmental science high school across the street from the garden that had 500 students, a real community school intended for a student of any ability. So we had kids with developmental disabilities and other things, um, but because there's sort of a green career for any of us, regardless of our uh, challenges or, you know, our strengths. And so that was an amazing experience. The Brooklyn Academy of Science and the Environment, which claimed the garden as part of the campus of the school. And I was just so honored that had just been launched two years prior to my going. I had two strong years in Brooklyn, 2005 to 2007 or so. And then, you know what happened, the you know, world economic downturn uh, kind of hit us. And we kept all those programs going in, in the youth programming. It was really tough but we didn't get into it just for a few years. So that was an amazing experience. We had five Gates Millennium Scholars, which are like the, the best scholarship you ever heard of. It's a full support all the way through doctoral study if you remain in the sciences. So you can't imagine these brilliant young people that were you know, uh, doing this. So it was, it was a real honor to be there. Well, what we did was uh, extraordinary. We launched a capital campaign. That was the intention when I got there. And my predecessor had done a master or a, a long range site plan for the garden. And it was kind of done at the 10,000 foot level, but it, we were gonna make some new gardens and fix some stuff that was old. 
And uh, we launched a $100 million campaign to uh, coincide with the centennial of the garden. We ended up going quite a bit over. We raised $125 million. We propelled into uh, 10 years of construction. We basically reworked every public entrance, all three of them. We built a fantastic new visitor center that you really have to see the images of this uh, with a living roof and with a lot of other sustainability features, but that won 20 awards, including North American architecture's highest honor from the American Institute of Architects. So that was just an extraordinary experience and you know, really good time in, in New York, you know, in the Bloomberg administration, it was a really strong time financially. Um, and so we did all of that. And then, you know, in the end, uh, I, uh, I identified an additional foundation gift uh, that uh, cumulatively was $10 million. And we redid the last sort of undesigned portion of the garden, this overlook that was kind of a earthwork that uh, separated the garden, the 52 acre botanical garden from the Brooklyn Museum. And we created this wonderful kind of uh, lazy ramp up it. And we added a new collection we didn't have filled with crepe myrtle cultivars that hadn't been hardy 50 years ago and still aren't hardy in the Bronx. So it was a, an enduring competitive advantage against our neighbors to the north at the New York Botanical Garden. But anyway, so we did all that. And so we, you know, I announced that gift to the board and my board chair, she draws her finger across her throat and she goes, no more big projects, you know? And I'm like, fine, you know, like no more big projects. I got it. It was like kind of construction fatigue, you know, fundraising fatigue. We just have been raising all this money. And so we needed to give it a, a rest for a while. And I said, you know, no more big projects. Great, we'll do small projects. There's lots of small projects, you know? But then, but then I started thinking, wow, really no more big projects? You know, God, why you leave money on the table? I'm, you know, I love big projects. And then I thought, well, you know, maybe after now nearly 15 years, I've done what I'm going to do here. And I got something else in me and I got one more thing. And so at that very time, uh, two other things happened. Brian and I had bought that property in Brookings and we're kind of intending to come back West and join you all in all the amazing things what we can grow. I always say here, what you cannot grow is not very much. Me, you pretty much grow everything. So, you know, there's no, it's not like that in the other parts of this continent, you know. So we're eager to do that. And uh, so I was thinking that. And then another thing happened. And this was an extraordinary experience. I'll just never, um, you know, uh, amazing to be involved with this. We had um, built in 1916 with McKimmon White, a famous New York architecture firm, a conservatory complex. And in the 1980s to a 1970s design had expanded it rather substantially with all these kind of biomes and kind of indoor learning things. It was really helpful with youth programs to have indoor gre greenhouses like that. And then we also had our own nurseries and conser uh, you know, greenhouses that supported growing plants in the garden. Well, right across the street from this complex, on, you know, on the optimal site on our 52 acre site for this glasshouse uh, uh, collection, um, a sort of rapacious developer proposed to build two 40 story towers with 40 foot bulkheads on top of them and about 460 feet tall. And they would have cost us about four hours of sunlight to the conservatories and these other things. And actually when we built the new conservatory complex in the eighties, that site, this building site, which is a former brewery, got down zoned to allow a seven story building. And that's what the present zoning was allowed. So um, this guy had greased the skids to change the zoning to build these giant buildings, the likes of which don't, there isn't anything in Brooklyn like that. And, uh, it, and it seemed like the political will was all there to make it happen. And I'm looking around and I'm thinking, oh no, and nobody else was going to do this. I mean, you don't accept these jobs without not knowing that at some time, at some point, the you know pedal hits the metal. So it was me that was going to have to do this. And I thought, okay, so when we prevail, when we prevail in the fight for sunlight, as we ultimately called this, um, I, you know, they're going to hate me. You know, I'm going to have to leave. You know, and so I could. I thought, hmm, you know, this is really tough. Well, right at that time, my predecessor, Bill McNamara at Quarry Hill announced his retirement. And I thought, you know, I love that garden. And I feel like I have had the benefit of so many wonderful mentors and experiences. And I, I kind of might know what's what and what are the heavy lifts. And I could do that for a few years and really help that place out. So I thought, I'm going to do that. And it was interesting. The, the search committee for Quarry Hill were... Um, 
you know, six of the seven of them I knew pretty well. I'd served on the board and, you know, or had raised money from for the conservatory and stuff. So anyway, uh, uh, that's what I did. And so I threw myself into that fight for sunlight and we did crazy things. You can't even imagine. I think we were always such, you know, kind of well-mannered supplicants to the city, you know, always, cause you know, they supported us and we were reliably pleasant and what's not to like about the garden and everything. Well, we did stuff that we just couldn't believe. And I, I kept thinking, thank God we didn't have Rudy Giuliani as the mayor because he would have cut the utilities to us because first of all, we did an exhibition in the conservatory. We did big scrims and showed what those towers would look like. And then you went around and all these cool plants are like these endangered Hawaiian hibiscus. The sign said, this beautiful plant is you know, at the brink of extinction in the wild and we won't be able to grow it anymore. And you as a New Yorker cannot have this you know, because because of these evil towers. And we got like a hip hop band that had their fight for sunlight, you know, song. And we did just all this kind of stand up with the, um, you know, with the TV. It was just total catnip to the media that we were doing this. Well, they were so PO'd. You can't even believe it. They were furious that little us would do this. And that was kind of scary, actually, to be honest. You know, I was thinking I was getting fitted for concrete shoes in this a little bit, but um, but nevertheless, we got 75,000 signatures on our petition. We, we got the series of, you know, hearings and public bodies that had to approve this project one by one to knock it out. And that, um, that building, you know, just died on the vine. Now, of course, it isn't over until they build something on that site, right? But uh, it was an extraordinary experience. It's one that New York Magazine said that there had not been such a public appeal popular public appeal in New York City since Jacqueline Onassis saved Grand Central Station. So it's very gratifying. And um, so I thought, you know, I'm going to do this and then I'm going to skedaddle. And, and that's really helpful because both the borough president for Brooklyn and the, um, the majority leader of the city council, wh who happened to be our council person, had been supporting the project. And they are now respectively the mayor of New York, Eric Adams, and the commissioner of cultural affairs over the garden. So the last thing they want is me around, right? So this all worked out and it was an interesting thing. I'm, you know, and it was a good, it was good timing. I was ready to do so. So anyway, there's me, leave New York, come to uh, Sonoma. Um, and, uh, but you know, after having done so many wonderful things, I hope you'll have a chance to visit that garden. I, I thought when I first went there, it was sort of European almost, you know, the iron gates and all that, but I, it's a uniquely American creation. It's really special and it is, really uh, in a way that this garden is too, but perhaps even more so because of the greater population. You know, Brooklyn would be the fourth largest city in the United States if it were separate from the rest of New York City. Um, it's so much a part of the community fabric of that borough and of that city. People just love it and they love being there and they, and, and it doesn't have all the plant richness that, you know, we can do here but it's still quite special and it and it's so special in how it wakes kids up to the natural world you know urban kids that might not do it know about it and such now let me think what what else was i going to tell you about all that well so i'd said that the brookings thing was part of that equation you know no more big projects fight for sunlight and the chance to move to this mild climate on the coast where what you cannot grow is not very much well, I have to tell you, you know, we struggle to grow things here in the Bay Area that really th that thrive in a book in Brookings in a way they don't either north or south. And it's I don't know what that is. If it's um, it's the sun, but it's the cool. It doesn't get it that hot. It occasionally has this Diablo wind situation, the river that comes out there and our property, about four acres, looks out the mouth of the river. You see these beautiful islands off the coast. Uh, you're looking at California and Crescent City, as I suggested, and um, but it's really sunny, and occasionally we get these kind of Chetco effect days where the weather goes to like, even in February, it'll go to like 100 degrees for just two or three days, and then the fog kind of cools it off. So, you know, things ripen. So the things that grow like mad and flower that don't do that, do so here, are like Embothrium coccinium, you know, is growing like three feet a year or all these Tasmanian natives, or you know, you name it on the Southern Hemisphere plan. And I had been a gardener and a plant recorder in New Zealand. So, and you know, got to know this wonderful collection of New Zealand plants here. And so really have assembled this extraordinary collection of New Zealand plants. 
And it's like, you know, combat horticulture, stand back, because it's all growing so fast. It's like, it's so amazing. So be sure to tune into the slides, because you'll see some of the specimens and things that we're growing. Aureliads especially, you know, you guys are all getting really good with all these pseudopanex and other things, but some of them were, um, you know, I just think they grow faster there. They just are on steroids or something. So it's an amazing, amazing climate and an amazing garden. I'm probably overplanting it. So I've got some, you know, I think we all uh, probably suffer from that a little bit. So, you know, uh, I've got some thinning, uh, you know, challenges ahead, but it's, it's great. And a lot of really rare stuff too. Um, you know, I was looking to see um, uh, um, the poor night's lily, which is Zeronema callistamin. So that's growing really mad. And is that flowering here at Striving Zeronema? Is it? See, now that's a plant that loves it there. You name it, like Trevisias and all these other tree Aurelias are really. And, uh, you know, I've been fortunate, certainly shopping here. You know, we would fly in from New York, go to Flora Grub, go to, you know, the Dry Garden, go to Berkeley Hort, you know, whatever, and just buy everything we could find, cram it into a rental van, take it up there and bang it in the ground. And we started doing that about 10 years ago. And then now, you know, that I've been a little closer, been able to add to that a little bit more. And especially, I had a really good history. Dan Hinckley, of, formerly of Heronswood and now Wincliffe up there, was a, a classmate. I'm a graduate of the Center for Horticulture at the University of Washington. But I used to go up there when I was director here and say, what do you have that's just going to freeze and die anyway? And you should just give me right now. The truck is right there. Just give it, you know. And so I, I was used to doing that. Well, I've started doing that too. Now to Sean Hogan at Sistus Nursery, who's been so generous and so interested in that climate. But also just recently, Steve Hoodman gave us a bunch of plants for Quarry Hill or Sonoma Botanical Garden, but also stuff I took to Brookings and Strange Aureliads. So there's no climate like it. I, it's amazing. And uh, New Caledonian conifers, really happy. You know, it's my neighbors who have lived there since about 1971 have never recorded a frost. And so like nothing below 34, even in the, you know, the famous 1972 freeze that killed eucalyptus in the East Bay Hills, or the, both the 1989 and 1990 freeze, which I lived in Seattle for that when it went to four degrees, it was like really cold. So um, I, I think here um, in the 72 freeze, like ficus knitted the street trees died in, in San Francisco and everything. So I think Brookings, you know, northern, more northern than it is, has really um, uh, done really well in those kind of freezes. So, okay, well, so there's Brookings, I'm all into it. You know, I used to work also at what is now the National Tropical Botanical Garden. But when I worked there in the 80s, it was the Pacific Tropical Botanical Garden. Well, I wanna found in Brookings, the Pacific Temperate Botanical Garden because it's just the be best place. It really is the middle of nowhere. This is why real estate is relatively affordable for coastal real estate. It's six hours from Glen Ellen, from Sonoma. It's six hours from Portland. There isn't great health care, so it might be good for the early stages of retirement, but not for the long run. But um, we're going to have fun up there. And that would be if, if Cal Horde or in conjunction with others, uh, I, I've I was sponsored by the Hardy Plant Society of Oregon as a um, judge at the Northwest Flower and Garden Festival this past February. But I've invited that group to come on a you know a distant field trip. If Cal Horde ever does kind of dis more distant um, field trips, uh, you'd all be most welcome, and I'm really eager to share that uh, that special garden with you. So okay, so I'm back on the West Coast. Those are the three things. So I've so I've come to uh, Sonoma Botanical Garden. Um, you know, it's interesting in the interview, and I said that I knew known some of these trustees, and I served on that board and watched that garden from the uh, beginning. And I, you know, honestly, I had questions and concerns about what was envisioned from the beginning. And there, uh, the vulnerabilities are as follows: it's pumping rather copious amounts of groundwater to irrigate that thirsty Asian collection. And I. Uh, encourage you to look on Google Earth at Sonoma Botanical Garden, and there is Sonoma Botanical Garden, which looks like the Amazon jungle, and then there's the rest of California, which doesn't look anything like that. It is the luscious thing in all of Sonoma County. There can't be anything like that, and you know that irrig overhead irrigation is why that garden is still there because you know that we had a really devastating fire five years ago, the Tubbs Nuns fire, and actually interesting the 
biggest wildfire in the United States just immediately prior to that was one on the Chetco River up in Brookings, which we nearly lost our place there. So, you know, we are in a changing climate. So the water use is not a sustainable dimension of that institution. And yet the overhead watering is a really good fire suppression model. The fire, if you've been there since then, it burned to all four sides of the property. I used to say three sides, but it actually jumped the highway and came back at us as well. We have such for survivor's guilt in that whole episode because, um, you know, our neighbors north and south and across the highway for days, everybody lost everything. So, you know, we have a lot of neighbors that really lost a lot of things. Actually, one, one neighbor who I adore and was a longtime trustee here at the garden, uh, San Francisco Botanical Garden, Arden Buckland, Sporer, she has her mother's big property and I, her mother's house burned, her grandmother's house burned in the uh, the glass fire of just two years ago. And everybody was so bereft about this. She told me she did a memorial service for the house because it was a little easier to let go, you know, because, you know, it's hard to get out of that kind of tape loop about having all this loss. So, you know, we're so lucky. We didn't lose anything. We have very old things at Sonoma Town Garden, things you may not have seen as the casual visitor because there's a whole additional property that the garden owns that we are moving to open. So I'll talk about that. But we have a uh, one cottage from 1904, another uh, house from 1910. Those buildings have been through four catastrophic wildfires since they were constructed and they were never lost. So there may be some topographic advantage to the way our garden is configured up against the uh, slopes of the Mayakamas Mountains there. There are kind of near foothills and then there are other foothills behind with deeper arroyos that come out. And the fire tends to follow the arroyo out. So we have less of a hinterland and maybe that's why we've not been uh, so, you know, so uh, burned. But you know, I took a fire ecology course at UC Berkeley that can be summed up the entire syllabus into three words. That is that pyrodiversity begets biodiversity. And pyrodiversity suggesting a diversity of fire regimes, intensities, and periodicities, it's what's given us in this amazing pulled apart evolution of uh, extraordinary flora in California, in part. There are other things as well, but you know, edaphic factors and everything, but fire has been a big factor in, in creating all the speciation. And so, you know, fire is part of the system, the fire is gonna return, the fire is coming back. So we've been really focused in my short time, especially on wildfire preparedness. So that's a second huge vulnerability for this institution. Um, a third one kind of relates to our history and our founder. Now, if you came to Quarry Hill, you probably learned a little bit about our founder, somebody I knew, not super well, but I, I knew her at meetings and went up there and May introduced me to her. And that was Jane Davenport Jansen, who was the, um, she was the daughter of a guy who founded a restaurant empire starting in Tennessee and spreading to se uh, seven or eight Southern states, Crystal with a K. It's kind of like White Castle. It was like a, you know, 1930s kind of depression era, very clean and very sort of family oriented uh, kind of restaurant thing. I always think of it a little bit like Mildred Pierce, the movie with Joan Crawford, where they opened one and it was a huge success. And they opened another one and then they opened another one. So anyway, Jane moved to San Francisco in 1958 as the heiress of this, as one of the heiresses of this restaurant fortune. And in 1968, she bought this property up there with a little modernist ranchette uh, in a vineyard and uh, with this upland with a knob cone pine forest on it. And there was a big flood about 1970 or something down the Arroyo and kind of wiped out her garden. So she got interested in replacing the garden and got involved with a really talented garden designer and horticulturist. Not always a, a, a pair of skills that go together. Now we've got some nice members of the audience that might re reflect that, Bobby, but, uh, but not always do planting designers know that much about plants and not always do people that know a lot about plants like many of us are able to combine them in ways that make places sing and that articulate space beautiful. Well, this Roger is, was a brilliant, is a brilliant designer and amazing. So he created a garden that was really special around her house and he had other fabulous clients in Napa and elsewhere. Um, and when I first saw that garden, it looked like an estate garden in Hillsborough. It was all very put together and you know, kind of herbaceous borders. And, and it wasn't quite Thomas Church, but it has certain modernist, you know, dimensions in the pool and that sort of thing. So anyway, that was, that was as it was when I first found it, found it. Well, Jane 
became interested in plants and plant conservation, and as you may know, then uh, was invo uh, involved in creating a consortium that led to a series of cl plant collecting expeditions to Asia and some 30 odd uh, collections, ultimately originally into China uh, in the late 1980s when uh, China first reopened to Western botanists and collecting into wild places, and then subsequently to Japan, Korea, and uh, the Himalayas. And uh, those were expeditions that others from the UK at Kew, Alpha partner in this, and uh, Lord Howick at an Arboretum in the North, in Northumberland, in the North of England participated in. And um, our uh, second director, Bill McNamara, part of all of that as well. And so, you know, a lot of cool plants came to our site as a, in return for Jane underwriting some 15 of those expeditions. And I've teased my colleagues in the UK, it's a little bit of a, was a little bit of a gravy train to have this American heiress kind of underwriting these months long expeditions to collect seeds, but it was good. and. Those collections are backed up also at Kew and at, at Hoek Arboretum. In my estimation though, it's very interesting. Quarry Hill is a very, it's a thirsty collection, right? It comes from a part of the world that receives year round rainfall, but it's also a bone hardy one. If you notice how many deciduous trees are there and, and how uh, this is, and that may be in part that they were collecting for Northumberland. So there's a lot of stuff that would be hardy to 20 and below and yet the coldest we're going to get is like 18 degrees Fahrenheit or something like that. So we really haven't collected for what the, you know, it's very hot in the summer, you know, 90 something today, but it's also pretty mild in the wintertime. So all these Aureliads and all these other things that, you know, things in Yunnan and other parts of Asia that would really thrive are really some opportunity for us. Well, okay, so we planted that. I think I was always concerned, and Dick, I think we shared this too, looking at that garden at the beginning, it's like the potential to really introduce something that might run amok is very high. You know, it's sort of not quite wholesale introduction, but a lot of cotoneaster species. And so, you know, maybe less discerning in the, um, you know, you, you had to justify the expedition. So getting your numbers up was important. But we brought a lot of stuff in and a lot of stuff that did run amok. And to their credit, they they pull like lace hysteria. If you've ever planted that in the garden, that's a thug. So we had that all over the place. It's not there now. But um, fortunately, there's nothing that's really jumped ship, you know, into the chaparral. And I think the thought was that none of these plants would persist outside of irrigation. But I kind of thought, well, how is that? How do we know that? You know, this is a this is a beachhead on the Western Hemisphere. You know, we brought this plant to the Western Hemisphere. All of us are natural thieves as gardeners. It's very easy if they seed, you can get a little some, take, try it in your garden, you know. So who knows where these gar plants go from there? So um, I've been a little concerned about the invasibility. And a lot of the plants that we have are not yet still reproductively mature, just 35 years in. It's going to be some years before they flower and we know what they might do. Well, so that's, a, that's an issue as well, plant invasibility. So we've got fire, we've got water, we've got invasibility. Uh, a big, the biggest one perhaps for us and the one that I felt like I could perhaps help, you know, maybe some with is a financial one. We have relied almost solely on the investment income spend of the modest endowment that our founder left us to operate that garden since we were created. So if the garden look a little starved for staff or resources or equipment, it is, you know, we haven't done all the things that other gardens do today to kind of, you know, uh, to work the earned and contributed income strategies to kind of, uh, you know, bolster what is, uh, what is an investment income span. So that, that's kind of how all museums are run today. You really have to do all that stuff. So we're in a very wealthy community. We just haven't really tried that hard on that. We also have, have an amazing asset in that we're, uh, and this is like any public garden would just you know pull teeth for, is we're in one of the top ranked uh, international tourist destinations in the world in wine country. And I tell you, you can only taste so much wine, you got to walk it off, right? So we, we have the potential to have an enormous visitation, but we're just not configured to welcome that or to make that easy for you. We have serious topographic challenges. If you've been there, you know, it is a hell climb at the start. And so the garden started in 1987, the Americans with the Disabilities Act, I think was 1991 or two. And so um, 
you know, we, we really don't have the accessible alternatives to our visitors. So we were taking people with vo volunteers on golf carts around, and that was a kind of a dangerous thing on these steep gravel trails, especially in wet weather, and insurance company not big on that. So that, that's, a, that's a vulnerability as well. But this financial one is really tough. We, you know, we don't have to do a too many years out kind of forecast to know that it's insufficient. Well, and then I'm gonna give you one last one and it's one that we've had our head in the sand about, you know, for years, we really don't have a use permit to operate as a botanical garden on this agriculturally zoned land, 35 years after we started doing so. And we've really just been a little shy and scared of it. And we just didn't want to do it. We also have a fairly dangerous situation if you're traveling south on Highway 12 to turn into the garden, to make a left turn into that gate. And Highway 12, you know, people fly on that thing. They go 70 miles an hour, you know, so, uh, so we really need a left turn lane. So I'm all about the, the big lifts and the tough stuff. I want to do, I, I, for a while, I, maybe I'm sort of wearing down on this a little bit. The pandemic's not been easy, but I'm like, I'm like anything that's hard, I'm all into. I want to do that, you know. So we have done a traffic study, engineering study, a design and costing for a left turn lane. So we know what that is. And we have to do that. There's no way we go forward as a cultural institution without that turn lane. It's just too dangerous. Um, uh, moreover, we've got into the use permit thing. And it's like blown up into like this full on EIR, as you can imagine. So just today, I got the uh, architectural historians kind of uh, report, which is great. But we've had archaeologists, pretty cool. They found um, uh, projectile points uh, in obsidian from the Glen Ellen formation. Fortunately, I guess for us that the quarry is not on our site. So these were projectile losses, you know, like the Native Americans were probably, you know, I think using not necessarily a bow and arrow, but an atlatl, if you know what that is, it's like you have a thing that sets into something and you throw it. But if you'd made this projectile point, you'd go look for it because it took a lot of work to make it. So we call them projectile losses because they couldn't find it, you know. So we've had some of those, but those are the archaeology and things. It was more, you know, uh, hunting grounds. And, uh, and now, um, in addition to, you know, biological survey, there's a lot of herpetology and other things, but now we're in a big way into hydrological survey, greenhouse gas, all the requirements of these use permits is amazing. And we're seeking not only the use permit to uh, uh, put into play some future improvements and modestly conceived, I will tell you, but also just even to operate as we already are presently. So that's a really big thing. And so um, the future plans, you know, so I, I've had a little bit of experience in this kind of long range site planning uh, on uh, with teams of others as a consultant in the 90s. And then as a client, you know, here we did a, a long range site plan for this garden when I was director. And um, so we've done, uh, we've focused mainly on circulation, uh, vehicular and pedestrian circulation for safety and accessibility reasons. So if you can imagine coming into the garden off of Highway 12 and there is the beautiful now, you know, scorched earth Mayakamas Mountains recovering in front of you, but you turn left and you kind of parallel the freeway in kind of a dull way, or the highway, a dull way, and then you come around, you can't see that view, and then you come up and park right by this arroyo and you start your adventure up this high hill. Well, what we're doing is we're gonna reverse that uh, one-way system. You're gonna turn right, you're gonna be looking at the mountains all the way there. Up at the site of our present greenhouse and everything, we imagine a, a the proper visitor center. And so we're gonna reimagine that site. I think it's the most important site on the property. And then you would just pass that park. The, uh, our, the, what was our office in the little modern ranchette, we envision as a sort of an event center. And actually Bobby and Georgia have helped us kind of plant that a little bit and make it a little nicer, you know? So it's a little bit of uh, a few Band-Aids, just kind of like, um, an idea out there. So, you know, if the county allows us, that's what we would do. Um, and then the big step, and I mentioned the California embrace, is we're opening this 22 acre additional property to the south, the Three Springs Ranch, which has extant uh, oak woodland, uh, uh, chaparral, and oak savanna. And I've done a lot of work to kind of reduce fuel wood and to prepare us to even consider this fall a prescribed burn on that property. And, but you know, it's really interesting to look at it because we're cheek by jowl against every kind of natural area reserve, the Bouverie Wildflower Preserve, 
the, the both the state and regional parks that surround us, there's just like the Sonoma Land Trust holdings, there's tens of thousands of acres, the Pepperwood Preserve, you name it. So what is it a botanical garden can do that complements what all of these natural area reserves are going to do? And so, you know, I, that's given me a lot of pause. And I, I, was, I was grateful that Ron Lutzko pay, spent an afternoon with me because I'm, I'm trying to think about if we're going to do some planting, you know, because what is it a botanical garden does? You label the plants so you know like, oh, that's what that is. I was wondering what that plant is. I've been looking for that. And you also introduce people, you know, hands-on horticulture, growing plants, right? This is what the California Horticulture Society does. So if we were gonna plant in some of the, you know, anthropogenically altered areas, I think the natural areas above us, these oak savannas, probably pretty much run that as an ecological reserve and don't plant in there, but there's a lot of properties. So if we planted, what could we do that's distinctive and enduring and that would be um, inspiring and really hold up? And so I've been spending a lot of time thinking about that. It sure looks good, I'll tell you now. And it wasn't when I got there. There's a lot of, lot of remnants of the of fire. We've moved our offices up into this modernist ranch house on the Three Springs uh, Ranch. Um, Brian and I live on the property in, a, in another house that uh, is kind of a back of a house area. We're gonna cluster our horticulture and facilities base. So we've done these basic things to get our ducks in line. And so I'm hoping to get that, um, that use permit secured. It's gonna take a little while once the application is in, perhaps this September to get it processed, but then maybe we can go forward and there's probably a little campaign ahead of us to make some of these basic improvements to do this. I say pretty much every day on that beautiful property, and it really is fantastic, that it's really worth doing. You know, we're the only botanical garden in the North Bay. There isn't one in Marin, Solano, uh, Lake, um, Napa counties, you know, so we really have a, 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 drive by, a drive to destination, but even in the Bay Area, I think what we do and the experience we can offer is a little different. I wanna end by talking about um, something that's a little delicate, but is, you know, among horticultural friends, is probably the, uh, another principal challenge. So I've described all these challenges, you know, and, you know, the opportunities are amazing, but the Asian garden is really, um, I feel, our first responsibility to be excellent stewards of that, that collection. That's what we did, you know, whether, whether it was right or not. I kind of wonder if we were starting anew today in this claiming, changing climate, and with these fire vulnerabilities and all the things we know about California, whether you would ever do that or whether you'd even be allowed to because of the water usage and that kind of stuff. And there is some elements of that collection that is kind of special and rare, but a lot of it, you know, maybe not so much, you know, it's uh, there, but you know, it's hard to say, but we can continue to augment it and make it a rich collection as rich as this collection is, is extraordinary. But, there was kind of an approach there because all of these plants were wild collected was to manage it as a very wild kind of woodland. And so that's how we sort of ad, have adv advertised it. It's a wild woodland experience. I can tell you that at 35 years old, that garden at the human scale is very wonderful. It's just really full and thick and shady and, you know, just, you know, lovely and because we irrigate it so much even when it's hot it's kind of cool in there it's unlike anything in northern california to go in there and uh, uh so it's it's special but it's really overplanted and uh so i'm always looking at it with a lens of like a hundred years from now like that tree is huge you know that tree is going to become huge and there's just cheek by jowl all these trees really close together so it needs a really wicked thinning and that's not going to be easy now the good news is that we planted multiple specimens of the same accession in many cases and so we can do a specimen evaluation say okay well this is one that's really good it's got good structure it's great that one is crap let's cut it down you know whatever we also have good propagation partners at both sean and my friend of 40 years, Kelly Dodson at Far Reaches Farm, both Cracker Jack propagators, that we could, you know, vegetatively repropagate some of these things, get better specimen, replant it. But we've got to go through that collection and clean the clock a little bit. We probably also, I've been thinking about, you know, the water budget that we're going to maybe be held to as part of this use permit, we may have to take out all the stuff that is extraneous 
and really focus on the things we really want. We cannot, we can't throw that much water at this probably going forward. We're going to have to have a plan to move to drip irrigation, maybe keep the overhead irrigation as a fire suppression tool. But I think this is going to be really tough. And then there's the, the worst of it. Part of the philosophy, because these were wild, that many of these plants have really kind of multiple stems. And as you all know, that if you let something that's quite big have multiple stems, they grow in together and you get what they call included bark, right? And so you've kind of baked into the tree in a way that you can no longer see so easily this kind of engineering problem. And it's very windy where we are. The winds come out of those mountains at you know 90 miles an hour at times. It's just crazy. And in the fire, super windy. So, you know, for many of these specimens becoming quite large trees, we've got some problems. And so I'll, I invite you to look at it. If you look at every start looking at every plant, you see a lot of multi-trunked specimens from this thing. And for my sort of horticulture training, that was a, a snip with a Felco's when it was two inches tall. You know, We could have had these things, but and maybe that seemed too much intervention. But they're all artifacts of nursery practice, not of, you know, this, it's, it's horticulture anyway. It's, we're not in the wild. So, so these, these are tough things. I was going on about this to Robin Perer, as you all may know, the Geraniaceae. She goes, she finally whips her head around and looks at me. And she goes, this place must drive you crazy. You know, that all this, it's like some twisted tree circus of like, you know, really funky specimens. But that's very true. I'm, you know, I wish it was not that way. And in some cases, it's a little too late to do the kind of pruning that would be necessary to kind of re- focus this tree is to something that would be a little safer in the future is really big, ugly cuts that just looks like you've hacked it all up. So that's where maybe we're going we're gonna to have to take some tough stuff. One of my predecessors at Brooklyn Botanic Garden once said to me, uh, uh, this was Betty Scolds, who was South African, fabulous, died at 99, not of COVID, but during the pandemic recently. She said, you know, the founders of Brooklyn Botanic Garden in 1910, they basically just did everything right. And I thought, wow, that's such high praise. And I had much cause to reflect on that statement. And I would agree with that, that they planned that garden for the ages. They really thought about how big these trees were going to get. And they kind of planted it to grow in to be this thing that they wanted it to be. Well, we haven't done that at Coriel. And now it's almost too late, but it's not too late. So we have got to do this tough chainsaw exercise and it's going to be it's it's going to be the right thing if we don't do it all these plants further suppress one another and the whole thing is kind of a, a mess so there's there's the tough love take on uh, Sonoma Botanical Garden well I probably have babbled on for a while but I wanted to be sure that um, you know we're going to get this presentation up I'm so sorry this is the first time I've ever done something like this where I really didn't have the um, the slides to show it, but um, they are great. And there's more to it as well. At the end, I thought if I had a little time, I could show you my 25 tax on herpetology list because I have had so many snake encounters in the house, snakes in the house, uh, rattlesnakes for days, but other, uh, actually recently, there's one of these like newts that actually had the toxic skin. You guys have these. But one got in the pool. Brian was telling me there was a lizard in the pool that was dead. Then I And it wasn't floating. It was at the bottom. Then I saw it move. I thought, oh, that poor thing. You know. So I get in there and like I scoop it out. And then for some reason, I knew to go wash my hands. But I'm like going, oh, pour more chemicals in. This is like, that is a scary thing. Those guys are really toxic. If you had the unfortunate uh, experience of eating one, you would not live through it. So they're super poisonous. But Anyway, lots of critters, including mountain lions, have had that experience as well. So I thank you all for being such a patient audience and rolling with me on really sort of a tough day to not have the presentation. But I hope you will take a look at it. And I'm just really grateful. Thank you, Bart. Um, and, and thank you all for made, uh, welcoming me back here to San Francisco. It's great to be here. Cheers. Thank you. OK, so Bobby. Any day. I'm mostly there all the time. So, yeah, come on down. I'd love it if you came as a group and we'd go look at disfigured trees, but we'd look at some nice trees too. And yeah. Yeah. And 
Um, and you would see the part of the property you've never seen, which is an enchanting and historic property, that Three Springs Ranch. It's really beautiful. So yeah, okay. You're most welcome and we're really eager to have you. Yes, sir, yes. Yes. So thank you, Cyrus. You know, what, what I thought when I got there, I think we bought in 1997, we bought this additional property or our founder did. Jane Jensen bought the historic Three Springs Ranch. And it's a much older property than where the garden is. And I think the intention was we were just going to move the Asian, plant, just keep planting and, you know, move on into that property. And I quickly ascertained that we are not guaranteed the water it takes to do what we've already created. And so we should draw a line around the irrigated acreage and not expand it at all. And so then, but we've got this other property. And I thought, you know, it's really quite a nice thing to balance our you know, historic focus on Asian flora with something that's a little bit more relevant. And all the elected officials have loved this. They said, the garden's great, but what's it got to do with my constituents and in the time we live in, you know? So, you know, in some ways this California focus and, you know, BART is that really alpha chapter in this kind of California native plant cultivation, we could do something quite special. And we're sort of cheek by jowl. And I think in a way that complements what all our neighbors in conservation work do, because we can help create a more botanically literate community, you know, by knowing about plants and knowing the ecology and some of the programming that attends that. Um, it's so funny though, now uh, here's my funny story. We, you know, we have California and we have Asia. So I Googled the word Calasia and I told Brian, I go, it's a restaurant in Los Angeles, you know, <laughs> but, and, 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 he, and, he, and I go, I don't, and I go, I think it's like a bad restaurant in Los Angeles. He goes, oh, it's, no, it's pretty good. Actually. I went there in the eighties, you know, so, so, so Calasia, that's us, you know. Oh, yes, please, Ellen. What is the native vegetation? Yeah, good. Thank you, Carol. Well, um, you know, it's interesting. So this is a, this is a really beautiful place. It's a 1947 modernist house. It looks like it was a John Yon or a Pietro Belusky kind of modern house. It's very sea ranch. It's built out of Port Orford Cedar that was harvested on the property. It's actually the coolest house in the town, I would think. And we, the stump that this Port Orford Cedar that they built the house from is like right next to the house. And they either brought a portable sawmill up or they took the log down the hill to the mill where that's still running today. And, and, and made this house. So it's really beautiful. So, um, and then it's kind of this Northwesty kind of entry in a circular drive and it was all mega huge rhododendrons, like 60 year old giant big rhododendrons, billowing rhododendrons. So the front is kind of an exotic, you know, ir somewhat irrigated collection. And that's maybe only about a 10th of the property you know, then there is the rest of it behind it is all in native vegetation. And so it is that kind of mixed conifer, but with Port Orford cedar, but huge Douglas fir and hemlocks and everything. And then all the usual suspects and, you know, kind of understory stuff. And uh, say again. Oh, yes. And so thank you, Brian. And so one of the things that's really famous about this town are uh, there are on this property like 400 year old rhododendron occidentale that are like, I don't know what, they're the size of my car, you know, like they're huge. And they're just, you could tell they burned or whatever they've done, but they're just really old specimens. So there's a dozen of those. Just down the hill was an early Oregon State Park, Azalea State Park, where they moved all the occidentale out of the town and clustered them in this property. So big occidentale, and they're all different too. They're like, you know, yellows to pinks and fragrant for days. So it's, it's wonderful. And so our intention is to not um, plant in the wild places and there's kind of nice trails in there, but it's beautiful and interesting in its own right. There is kind of a chaparral area where it was disturbed. And that's where we're doing a little assisted migration. And we've been planting a lot of things from Carol's land down there. Like um, recently, I just got Sudasuga macrocarpa, the big cone spruce from the um, from the south. Um, we got a bunch of Circocarpus trasque, arguably the most endangered tree in North America, that Catalina Island um, mountain mahogany, Cat island mountain. Um, and then, um, but other stuff. 
Oh, Camara Starophilus, diverse, oh, which uh, Barb was telling me is becoming, it's jumped ship in the East Bay Hills and Camara Starophilus is becoming, so we've been planting interesting sort of things for the Southland that may not be, um, you know, as the climate worms so happy down there, but they sure like it there. So, you know, sort of near natives, if you will. So, yeah. Very good. Um, so absolutely. And we do have these quarry ponds. We, you know, we haven't gotten very far in the catchment kind of, you know, opportunities and technology, but we have enough of a, um, uh, you know, a elevation drop that there, that'd be very possible with the buildings that we have and other things. What we do do is we do recirculate water and we've had a serious aquatic weed problem in the ponds. If you've been there recently, you'll know that, um, you know, ducks and other flying birds have um, uh, sort of brought azola and other aquatic weeds to those ponds. And so I think we've got a plan. We've just put in a ma major solar array, which will at least take away about $50,000 annually in PG&E expense to pump groundwater. And so we can run the systems. I mean, we might burn the pumps out faster, but we can run the system in the daytime quite a bit more. And if we oxygenate that water, then we're going to have less with this aquatic weed problem. So that's part of it. But, you know, through that whole thing and understanding how we're moving this water through there, a lot of it does just, you know, if we irrigate, it percolates back into the pond. So we're sort of capturing some of what we're throwing around, but not all of it, of course. And there is evaporation and all that sort of thing. So um, you know, one of the pro projects I was going to tell you all about at Brooklyn, we did an amazing, amazing stormwater uh, project that it was innovative at the scale, scale of North America. And so I met some of the kind of leading um, sort of uh, engineering fo minds on this kind of system. So I think that's something we haven't really scoped, but it's a great question because, you know, there could be a, a blow ground detention in um, cisterns and things like that. And you could, we have sufficient rainwater that we could hold it and do it. Uh, I don't, whether it meets our water budget needs, I don't know, but we're just getting into that hydrological study now. Wow, always count on Carol, good questions, right? Yeah. Well, yes, yeah, certainly. So Bart asked the question, what are the water rights? Well, now this is a, you know, um, we have a lot of wells on this property and we have springs on it, hence the three springs, right? And so I think they're all ours. Now, what I'm seeing is though that the uh, Bay Area governments, Sonoma County and the state of California are all, you know, moving towards metering and regulating use of groundwater. And where that goes in agriculture, I don't know. There's such a lobby in Sacramento and stuff, but we'll be like small fry in that conversation. But I think even, even if we had the rights, um, it's still not right. You know, we're trying, we should be modeling the way, you know, you know, not modeling the problem, we should be modeling the solution. So it's, these are really good questions. And I think it, much of that is still ahead of us, but at least a baseline understanding how much we're pumping and how much we're potentially wasting would be a really good start. Um, not yet. So what all we're doing right now in the hydrological survey is just figuring out how much we're pumping, you know, but I think that's interesting because that, that is a very good question. I have a not very scientific a term, which I refer to as ecological amplitude. Um, I once saw a Thuya orientalis, a species that I think grows in all 50 states of the union because it grows in Alaska and I've seen it in Hawaii. And I once saw one on a uh, Las Vegas um, Springs Preserve site uh, owned by the water district on a, on a former sort of quasi-residential thing where it had not had a drop of water for, you know, 60 years. And there it was, it was 116 degrees and it looked perfect, you know? So, and yet that is a plant that comes from kind of saturated soils in wetter areas. So some plants have quite a bit of tolerance regardless of where they came from. So, you know, it, evaluating our collection in that way would be interesting, but mainly we've just watered it like mad. I mean, we really do throw a lot of water around. And so, 
you know, the, the technology exists. You look at Philoli, how they retool themselves to better care for an older garden by sort of micro delivery. And, but the, it just co comes with costs. You have to have sort of irrigation technologists that's checking all the emitters and constantly, you know, managing the system. But, I, I, you know, expensive, but, you know, necessary, I think, probably. Sure. Well, how fun. What an attentive audience. Those, audience. Those are great questions. I really appreciate it. Right. Ah. Right. I. It's a, it's a great question. You know, and Sean sort of encourages that we should go to drought tolerant, you know, Western Asia, right? And yet, you know, that's kind of bone hardy land too. So, you know, I'm also sort of more interested. I brought something because you know, what I learned in San Francisco, uh, what I took away from working here was that you always want what you cannot have. Because I watched all these San Franciscans putting ice on like lilacs and peonies, trying to get them to flower. And I'm like going, why would you want to grow that? But you could grow like a thousand plants at a grow field. But you know, one of those plants might be gardenias, which grow so fantastic. So I think this is mystery, but we're growing about a dozen gardenias and they just flower like crazy and they're great. First Love is a particularly good one, but there's so many new ones and some that are coming from the, um, the Southeast that are actually flower all summer long and that kind of stuff. So I, I would, you know, I think our era of, you know, independent expeditions that we were mounting in partnership is maybe over, at least in my time it is. It's, it was expensive. A lot of other people are in that game today. And when we started in that, we were maybe the first in certainly into China. And so, um, so there's, you know, sh partnerships and sharing. And even for us to acquire from some of our colleague institutions like Atlanta Botanical Garden, where my colleague, Mike Wenzel, who's here with us tonight, curator of Living Collections, um, they've shared some things with us from their collecting. And, you know, Kelly, you know, has gone a lot to Asia. So we could, you know, get plants. I think maybe after we've done this thinning, if you will, that probably the appropriate thing that justifies the water budget and other expense to do that would be to go after the most endangered Asian woody plants. That it really should be more endangered, planted, endangered plants that we should feature if we're going to really carve out space for it and do it. I don't see how you justify it so easily otherwise. But I, I think that's going to be for my successor. I should say, you know, I don't intend to do this forever. And because uh, there's other stuff I want to do too. But I do want to do some of the things that I think are hard. And so that my successor doesn't have to do those. And that this place could, you know, maybe make it, you know, public gardens are tough. I mean, we've known those that have folded. There were those that folded in the depression. Um, in the Southland, you may have known the California Botanical, or, or, yeah, California Botanical Garden was something that went down the tubes, and like the Berry Botanic Garden in Portland and stuff. So, you know, it's it's a precarious thing. And so, um, uh, you know, Quarry Hill has a lot of assets. Had it been burned in the fire five years ago in the Nuns Fire, the next day it would still own 67 acres and have a 14 million dollar endowment. So, you know, it maybe is not going away, but whether it could be all that it started to be is really kind of a, a serious question. And so we are just trying to grow up and you know, like embrace these tough adult questions and see if we can find a way through them. Well, again, thank you very much. Come on, I do hope you will come visit. Cheers, thank you.